Good evening. Welcome to the Sundown and Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 22nd of February. Um, <clears throat> we got a, a bit of a, a little bit of a full agenda tonight. Um, but first, I think we're going to do a, uh, let the uh, finance committee, you guys need to take a vote. So we're going to let you guys do your vote first. And then we'll roll into our minutes. And we've got, but uh, I won't say full on budget presentations, but we've got um, budget discussions from Frontier and Central Elementary School. And then we've got our usual uh, updates and public comment section. So, um, and just a quick reminder too, we are broadcasting on channel 12, I'm told tonight, instead of 15. So uh, folks may want to pass that along if possible. In preparation for parachute deploy. Oh, and if somebody could just make sure that you're muted, unless you're talking, that'd be great, just so that we don't get some extra feedback. Thanks. All right, Elliot, go for it. Thank you. Uh, calling to order Central and Finance Committee at 6.34 p.m. Uh, we will bypass the normal reading of minutes uh, to move on directly to the vote uh, for the funds transfer uh, in the amount of $8,000 uh, transferred to account uh, two twenty. 5145000 uh, to cover for fire department payroll, uh, increasing amount of time needed for on scene time at fire calls, payrolls underfunded. Uh, Steve Benjamin requested this in 15 December, and this has uh, been an urgent matter that uh, was discussed at fire uh, during the fire department's budget presentation. And uh, this has been a regular ongoing uh, issue where they've needed to transfer. Uh, amounts to cover increasing time that they need at fire call. So uh, do I have a uh, motion for discussion or do I have any questions? Move to approve. I have a second. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, all those in favor of uh, approval of the transfer in the amount of $8,000. Please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Excellent. Aye. aye. Vote is 4-0. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to uh, the rest of the select board. Thank you very much for your patience and for uh, letting us go first tonight. Yeah, no problem. All right. Um, so why don't we do our minutes first and get that out of the way for the minutes for February 16th. Motion. I'll second. All right, all those in favor of the minutes from February 16th? Aye. Aye. All right, three to zip on the minutes. <clears throat> and let's see, hold on one second. Do we have, because next up is our presentation from Frontier and I don't know who, there he is. Okay, I didn't see you on there for first. So <clears throat> then I'll turn over the floor to Superintendent Modesto. How are you? Hello. Hey. Hello, everyone. Hey, Darius. Thanks for, having us. Thanks for having us. So I guess we're going through Frontier, then we'll go through the elementary. That's uh, the scoop. Yep, that's what, yeah, that's how it's listed on here. So, all right. Well, you guys all know Shelly Pareda. Um, our director of business administration. So she will, she'll walk us through the details of it. I'll just kind of give you a general outline where we are. Right now, Frontier is, um, this is kind of where they are in their draft of the budget. They haven't actually voted this to move forward to, um, you know, to the uh, public hearing that we're gonna have, um, I think, you know, in two weeks, okay? So um, they haven't actually voted this, but I think it's pretty much, we had a good discussion the other night. And so it's kind of where they're headed. Um, and as you probably ever heard wind from, and so the public will find out as well that we talked, discussed that Sunderland's um, assessment is up very high this year from Frontier. And so we'll, that's probably the, the big topic of discussion for the Frontier part, but not to, I think I gave away the punchline, Shelly, for you, but, um, but she will walk us through, um, she sent out materials earlier. So you wanna jump on or on mute? Yep. Okay, so I did share with Jeff uh, the narrative for Frontier and for uh, Sunderland Elementary. Uh, so this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, normally Darius or I would share our screen during a school committee meeting so everyone could see what we were talking about. Um, but hopefully you all have that. I hope Jeff forwarded it off. I did fix one typo um, that was, oh, perfect. Yep, he's pulling it up. Hi. Thank you. Great. Um, it's the way my only job. 
Uh, so just to give a little bit of a history, this is going to repeat for Sunderland Elementary just to show you what our process was, um, but we started building the budget with a level service approach um, to generate the first draft. So all existing staffing programs and services were duplicated from the prior year. So we moved everything from 21 straight over to 22 to start. Um, and then we looked at what the COLA and STEP increases would be based on contract ob obligations with teachers and instructional assistants. Um, for Frontier to the general fund, it's about $215,000 that uh, resulted from COLA or STEP or column changes. Um, so it's not directly 214,000 because there may have been some fluctuations of staff outgoing um, or uh, changes in personnel that that number might not directly hit the bottom line, but just so you know overall that our teachers and our instructional assistants um, the total general fund increase there is 215,000. Um, so then we look at increases for non-union staff. Uh, that includes custodians, secretaries, um, principal, uh, central office staff, Sunderland's uh, portion of the central office staff. Um, so those wages are included in there for an increase as well. And then we review non-salary accounts based on prior year data. So I looked at the last couple of years um, make fluctuations up or down depending on where we have been overspent or underspent. Um, and then we also built in a three and a half percent increase for operating related expenses such as utilities and insurances, um, retirement assessment, that kind of those kind of expenses. Um, we want to make sure that we're covering our bases there so that when our premiums come up for renewal. I think the biggest one that we uh, always get nervous about is the health insurance. I'm sure the town feels this on their end as well. Um, we are hearing that we're going to be level with benefit um, increases and that there won't be a significant increase, but, you know, at this point, we just don't know those numbers. So we did build in a build in a three and a half percent. So then we look at enrollment projections and class sizes to make sure uh, whether or not we need additional staffing. Um, and then we look at our, uh, this has um, Oh, it doesn't have a typo, sorry. Finally, we look at the revolving funds, school lunch, school choice, and special education accounts. We just wanna make sure that any expenses that we paid the prior year from those revolving funds can continue to support the expenses that are normally paid based on the revenue coming in. So looking at that, um, the draft from February 11th shows a 2.97% increase over the prior year for Frontier. If you remember, we did level fund last year for Frontier. Um, so the total increase is just over 341,000. Uh, so the general fund budget is 11.8 million. Um, and then we will use additional revenue sources, revolving funds and grant monies primarily to cover the full operating budget for Frontier, which is roughly 12.8 million. Um, so some of the major factors that I didn't already discuss above um, include the addition of a point. 0.5 world language teacher. So that added about $30,000 to the budget. Um, this is a position that has been vacant for a couple of years and we have filled in the gaps here and there where we've needed to um, with stipends to certain personnel that were qualified to teach those language classes. Um, but the school would really like to move forward with getting that back on track to um, a more permanent position. Uh, and then we have a $21,000 increase to the Franklin Regional Retirement Assessment. Um, that number did come in already, so we're confident in what that assessment looks like. And then uh, miscellaneous expenses. As I said, we do review prior year's data. Um, we have an increase that we're looking at for building repairs, minor increases that have totaled up to about 20,000. Um, building repairs, hardware and software, so technology related things and then some miscellaneous stipend accounts. Um, for example, this year we are adding a anti-racism um, committee stipend. So, you know, just some small little adjustments here or there that equated to somewhat of a reasonable number that we wanted to mention. Um, can we scroll down a little bit so I can keep going? I can stop and see if anybody has questions yet. Also, if that's best, I don't know how you want to proceed. Should I just keep plowing through? Yeah, and then if somebody has okay. questions, they can do a hand raise or, or just pop in. Perfect. Um, so I'm not going to read all the numbers here on the budget snapshot, but basically what I wanted to give you are each of the function codes. So DESI has function codes. 
um, that we're required to report on and that we categorize all of our expenses in. So the 1000 is administration, 2000 is instruction, which is anything related to direct teaching. Um, 3000 is pupil services, which covers um, nursing, transportation, food service, athletics, um, those kind of expenses that are uh, not direct instruction, but also related to students. 4,000 is operating, 5,000 is benefits, and then 9,000 is any out of district placements. So I gave you a couple year historical data here so you can see where we've been um, over the last couple of years and, and fluctuations of each of those categories, and then the breakdown of what the 341,000 um, by each function code category. Um, obviously there's a lot of other numbers within each of those categories, but those are the main function codes that we report to the state on. Um, and then we keep scrolling. So this is the assessment information. Um, total chapter 70 funding uh, that we will receive is uh, almost 2.9 million. And then the four town required contribution is just shy of 5.5 million. Uh, we're looking at about 185,000 in regional transportation. Uh, the school committee would like to continue with $200,000 from excess and deficiency funds to help offset the assessment to our four towns. Um, so the total remaining assessment to be funded by the four towns was uh, just over 3 million. So our total budget again is 11.8 million at this point. Um, so some factors that contribute to uh, the assessment for each of our towns is enrollment. And there's two different enrollment figures that are factored in. One is the state enrollment calculations, and then there's the five-year rolling assessment that we look at as a school district. So you can see here, uh, the state is showing, based on what we've reported for enrollments, 14 new students attending Frontier. Um, and it's based on the October one of the prior year. So next year's enrollment figures for the chapter 70 funding and the town requirements is based on October one of 20. Um, so we're looking at an increase of 14 students coming from Sunderland to Frontier. And then the five-year rolling calculation actually has it down three students based on dropping off the, the oldest year. So the contribution, the cost share percentage actually changed slightly there from 24.15% to 22.85%. Um, so what does that mean for Sunderland? Uh, it is not a great <laughs> end number for you all to be looking at. As Darius said, it is a pretty significant increase. Um, if you look at the bottom line here, the state required contribution is significantly up um, from 1,118,000 to 1,270,000. And again, that is mostly related to um, the, those additional 14 students because you're paying a cost per pupil that attends the district. Now, the calculation is not that simple. It takes a lot of other factors into consideration, including the town's wealth. Um, but I think the numbers of enrollment clearly help us wrap our heads around why the number is so significant at the state level. Um, so then the general fund balance to be uh, covered is based on that 22% that we talked about based on the five-year enrollment. Um, so that is also up pretty significantly. There's not as much as an increase to transportation there. It's just a minor amount. Um, so the total that we're looking at is uh, $1,976,069 for the town of Sunderland, which is a 14% increase or $242,000 higher than the prior year. Um, and that act, that's actually a little bit lower. You know, we work to get those numbers down as, as to be as attractive as possible and as fair to all of our towns to make sure that we're still meeting the needs of the school, um, but also making sure that they're, you know, realistic things that can be hit by our member towns. And, you know, this is where we're at at this point with school committee and what they're looking to um, move forward with at this point for public hearing and voting for next year. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. I know it's a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Elliot? Hi, uh, Shelley, is the, is the transportation drop mostly due to COVID uh, and then going back up because of returning to hybrid? So the transportation um, number in there, are you talking about for Sunderland's assessment or are you talking about the state um, reimbursement number? 
I wish I could scroll back up. Um, um, yeah, uh, here. I just, what... Yeah, I was just about... looking at the, okay, that's the, yeah, the amount, I'm just wondering why the amount, the total contributions have gone down. Is that just because of COVID? Or is that... So are you referring to the 199,000 and the 183,000 here, Elliot? That, and it's mirrored also in the, the required contributions as well. Yeah, so it depends how much we put towards um, how much we're gonna get from the state for required um, reimbursement. So they never fully fund regional transportation um, and they're predicting that it's going to go down next year. And then we only budget for about 75% of that to be paid. Um, to be received as revenue, because if they cut that mid year, you know, we don't want to be fully capped um, maxed out. So, you know, there's a few little factors in there in the formula and how we calculate that. Um, but if our transportation is say it's 400,000 and we know we're getting 183 from the state or we're anticipating getting 183 from the state, the difference is what is distributed to the four towns based on the cost share percentage. Does that make sense? Sort of. Yeah. I cover your question, Elliot. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I think go. so. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I, I'm still mostly noting just the fluctuation from 21 to 22, but yeah, that drop. Because the yeah the chap I guess that that's because of the chapter 70 it looks like it's going up as well. So I think I missed that. Yeah. Uh, it, do we want to scroll down again to Sunderland's assessment? That way we can take a look there. Um, so the state required contribution, which again is that per pupil amount, that's got going up pretty significantly. Um, transportation's not seeing a huge increase, again, because it's just a small amount that the four towns are dividing up. So Sunderland's only paying, you know, 22% of um, whatever the difference is between our total transportation and then the state reimbursement. So I can look at that number a little bit closer, Elliot, and then get back to you all just to make sure that my calculations are accurate. Um, I feel pretty confident in that formula, but since you are questioning it, it's always good to just take a second look at it. And we're not getting a huge um, amount of increase. If we can scroll back up a little bit, sorry. Um, you know, in our chapter 70 here, FY20 to FY21, we're only seeing $16,000 increase for what the state is actually funding for us. And that is because um, Frontier is in a position that's called hold harmless with the state, which means even if your enrollment numbers drop, which we are seeing decline um, pretty consistently across the district, you're guaranteed to get the same amount that you got the prior year plus $30 per pupil. So that 16,800 is only $30 per pupil based on the enrollment number that they use right now for Frontier. So you may have heard um, some things about the Student Opportunity Act and other towns and districts around us seeing you know, millions of dollars. I think Greenfield was getting upwards of a million, if not more than that. And they're getting that because their enrollment numbers are not declining. So they're not in that hold harmless state. So they're seeing significantly more in chapter 70 money than a district like ours is where either we're level or our enrollment numbers are down from the prior year. Hopefully that's helpful to explain why there's not so, so, such a significant change there. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So if I could ask the question about the five-year ruling assessment, what's the impact? I see the percentages. What does that equate to to numbers? I understand the state side. I'm curious about what the district agreement has its impact on our increase. I'm not sure I understand that question. I don't know if Darius, if you know what I might be looking for. Are you for. asking for the, the breakdown of the five-year, looking at all the five... All, five, all the four towns 
five year numbers? Yeah, I know that I know the population, a, I know that the population moves in and out any given year. I understand that and the distribution. You know, we had a there's a value associated with the, the state assessment or the state's assessment to the minimum contribution for Sunderland. My question is what's the district impact the what's the um, district agreement impact? I guess I don't understand what you're asking either. What we mean what's the district agreement? How does the, the equation work out? following the district yes. agreement? Yes. Shelly, you have that in the, you broke down the, the five-year numbers showing what years were dropped and what years were added. So you could, you could see the predictability of what's gonna happen next year. Is that what you're asking, Scott? Yeah, so we look at it and we see, we know we have, uh, it looks like a plus of 13, I think if I'm not mistaken, right? You minus three plus 14, 11. And right. We're we're basically the cost the cost of attendance is just short of twenty two thousand dollars a year. Is it linear to Sunderland? Is that what I'm seeing? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around the question. Um, so the question is: the state gives its convoluted formula and there's an assessment to the town in its ability to pay. What, if any, impact is there from the district agreement outside of just the increase in population, meaning population of students from Sunderland attending Frontier? I believe there is no other factors within the, I'll pull it up and double check that, but I think it's, it's running based off that off the enrollment of the five-year average. Okay. And it's it, 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 near the cost of attendance or just proportionate percentage off of the operating budget total? It's the percent. Sorry, 20. I don't, don't want to be quoted. I don't want to be quoted and be wrong, but I believe it's yeah. the percentage of the total. It's the percentage of the population of the operation budget. See, I, I, I think I'm backing into maybe where my question lies with a declining enrollment, but an inc a global enrollment, but an increased enrollment pop percentage from the town of Sunderland, that number is, um, can become pretty stark. I think I understand what you're saying. We talk about declining enrollment, we are down six kids from last year. So it's not this yeah. huge number that we're seeing across the district. Across the district, we're down 138 across all five schools. Got so it. So there is, and those are, those are, we can talk a little bit about that. It's gonna talk a little bit about that when we get to Sunderland Elementary because a lot of those numbers are the preschool and the kindergarten where families either chose to go, um, one, we couldn't open up all our preschools to the full capacities where they were at and two, people took private options where they had more childcare um, options available as well. And then in kindergarten, some people chose not to put move their children forward to kindergarten. We had to opt out a year because of the where things stood in September. Um, hopefully, we're in a much better spot now. So, so I'm just kind of saying those those numbers enrollments overall are kind of fluctuating all over the place because we don't know all the students that are left they're going to come back or not. Um, so. so but I, I, just, Go ahead. I heard you say earlier that you're down over the five-year average 130 students. No, not the five-year average. I'm talking about overall. Overall, got it. The entire UN30 Frontier and UN38 districts were down 138 students. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Frontier is only down six, which got is it. Um, more because in the reason for that is the majority of the students who are 94 of that 138 are in pre-K or K. Got it. So a lot of it has to do with child care and, um, you know, seeking alternate, um, you know, you know, preschool can be optional, you know, yep. um, for, for some families. So, yeah, so Thank we're talking you. about, I just want to make sure when we talk about decreasing enrollment that Frontier's not down 60 kids and we're coming in with a budget that's up and asking for more positions. You know what I mean? Right. It's, we're, we're, we're stacking. But I also hear what you're saying is our other towns down and we have that information. I can get that to you. We, it's Shelley, it's part of your other report that you gave the Frontier. Okay, I'm happy to pull anything up. I can't get back to my um, main screen while it's in the sharing view, but I, if we wanna look into that right now, I'm, I'm happy to pull up other reports while we're continuing this discussion. Oh, thank you. 
I guess, shall I see if you can pull up that, that page from the Frontier, it's a the, the public doc in the sense that it had the, they can see the five year enrollments from all four towns and they can, and, and plus the years that we dropped. We show the last two years that we dropped so they can also see that pattern. I think that's what Scott looking for a little more information on that end. And if we can't pull it, we can send it to you. And that's, 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 that's not critical for tonight. I'm just, it's a curiosity on any given year. Is it possible to paste something into chat? I don't know how chat works on. on can, you, can you present you your screen? Can you permission? Don't, Tell don't I think let... you can share the screen. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Can you see that? Yep. Very good. Okay, so I think that this highlighted amount is our chart is what um, Darius is referring to. Got it. So that shows you the five year. So um, all, we're, we're all the way back to 2017. Yeah. <laughs> Meeting our enrollment, but thank you. Yeah. Let me know when you have digested that enough. <laughs> and I can share those numbers with Jeff too, and then he could get them too, if that's something that you all want to take a closer look at. Yeah, that'd be handy. Thank you. Okay. The only positive line is that, or the probably something that we probably should discuss is that next year, your current sixth grade class is very small in right. comparison. And so you're gonna have a huge drop next year I mean, you, right now our current sixth grade class is um, 13 students in it, okay? And then the following year has got 35 students in it, right. according to, we have data we have in front of us now. So we're gonna have this up and down bump again um, as we roll in those huge numbers of difference. And I don't think the other schools have as much um, uh, fluctuation over the next two years. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it seems like we've had the most growth over the last couple of years of the, of the towns. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I was going to ask, did you guys make more revenue this year due to some of the apartments and whatnot? And, and there's kind of, I mean, that's what happened with Conway last year, or the year prior, rather. They, they made a couple hundred thousand dollars extra in revenue in the power company, and it went in and went out to their frustration, where the state just says, took it away. So I don't know if that's, you guys obviously will discuss that, but. I'm hoping that's somewhat the case that you have more revenue. <clears throat> well, and I think if you look historically, you know, back at the increases, um, two years ago, it was 2.67% increase. And last year, because of the level funded budget, it was actually a decrease of six, almost six and a half percent. So last year it went down 111,000 compared to the prior year. So, you know, it's not, continuing to rise. I think we're just seeing a bump in the enrollment, um, but there have been years where it hasn't been as typical, at least, or, or, or as much as an increase over the last couple of years. And, so, and I guess to where maybe Scott was getting at, I don't know how the five-year rolling average is helping right now. <laughs> you know? Um, well, but the, the line, I didn't do a very good job of explaining it. I wanted to ensure that there was no tension between the state assessment, the base formula that is part of the state, the state formula and any additional that's a function of the uh, district agreement. That's all I was driving at. Okay. Oh, okay. You know what, I'll look at the, I'll look at the district agreement as well. Yeah, and the cost share percentage change is minor, you know, 2.4 to 2.2 really isn't what's making a big difference. It's really on the town, on the state required amount of it um, that Sunderland's getting hit significantly hard this year. And that, that in, in and of itself is its own black hole. You don't really necessarily know if it's EQV or whatever it is. Thank you. Shelly, did you have any, anything else to cover for Frontier or, or was that? 
Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I just lost the whole <laughs> Zoom screen. It disappeared. No, it's okay. I'm used to Google Meet now because that's what we use for everything. Um, I don't have anything else to add unless you have some more additional specific questions. Um, you know, I have some notes about why the function codes are, you know, the specific function codes, whether it's admin or student specific, why there's increases there. Um, but overall, you know, I think that that document that we shared is pretty self-explanatory and really hits all of the major points um, that we wanted to make. I noticed there was a good jump in the admin side. This, this will go around. Yep. Um, and that is partially related to um, support staff uh, increases as well as anyone who's on an individual contract. So myself, Darius, um, principal, any other you know, senior administrative staff uh, raises. And then um, we've also seen an increase in our administrative software and technology that we use to communicate out with the community. Um, part of that related to COVID because this year we had to add different platforms and things like that. And we're always trying to improve communications and their programs we're gonna wanna stay with in the future. Um, so, but it's primarily uh, wages. Okay. Have there been any shifts from uh, use of external funds choice or grants to the operating or the assessment side that are gonna be permanent? Um, permanent shifts to another funding source? Well, permanent shifts to the assessment. Like we did with um, a couple of years elementary. ago, yeah. right? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think we moved anything off of school choice that was significant um, over to the general fund. Um, if anything, we have moved some things off of general fund onto an alternative funding source next year right. to keep the number down. Um, you know, and we'll have to reconsider in 23 you know, where we pay for those items. It's not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but right. you know, little bits of things here and there. And are there any grants that are winding down that are shifting onto the operating budget? No, not currently. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the one that we will have discussion about it's across the district is the nurse leader position that was on a grant. We have one more year of that grant next year and then we have to decide whether or not we're gonna fund that <clears throat> entirely the following year. Um, Fortunately, um, that worked out well for us this year because we had the funding to pay for Meg when we absolutely needed that position. So, yep. um, we, and we put that all on there, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting what two years brings us, not next year, but the following year, we're gonna have to decide that. Right, right. <clears throat> thank you. I don't what have anything the, further for Frontier if there's no other questions. Okay, what other questions do folks have about Frontier? Anything else? Keith, do you have anything in the school committee? You're the school committee rep for Frontier. Not just call you out, but. <laughs> but we'll call you out anyway. <laughs> I just want to, yeah, I got to recognize those guys that do the work, too. So. No, uh, no, I thought Shelly did a great job. I was looking at that other, um, the enrollment uh, figures that Scott was referring to. I think that Scott's question about um, moving other funding sources. We tried to stay away from that because we didn't want to present a, a false budget. We wanted to give the true numbers and then we didn't want to um, start funding things that we couldn't support going forward. All right. I think folks are digesting that. So <clears throat> I'm sure we'll have more discussions and questions as we move along too, so. So the timeline, just to let you guys know the timeline on that. Um, so we have a frontier meeting next Tuesday. Um, originally that was gonna be the public hearing, um, but it kind of was a, we felt kind of a rushed on the first presentation of the budget then going to public hearing. So if the public hearing will be the following Tuesday, the 9th, we have to have the public hearing by the end of March um, because of the state law basically said you have either 45 days before the first town meeting, which is usually kind of late, mid to late March, but or uh, March 31st. So our deadline is March. So um, the school committee put in, you know, one more meeting to hear any other public comment. Then, um, you know, we'll have the public hearing and then they left a couple of weeks in case. We learned that a few years back where we had a public hearing and then we, we had such a limited amount of time to react to the public hearing on that um, in time. So the other side is it's, also difference is that the elementary budgets are on a different times time cycle because they can be. And as you hear about the elementary budget, this is a good segue for that. The elementary budget, because it's um, 
there's no time there's no timekeeper other than writing up your um you know writing up your stuff for town meeting you probably have to do like seven days prior i forget what the law is there um and get that publicized there is no other timeline on us so the more information we have about what the fall looks like and what we know about um some of the revolving accounts which shelly is going to talk to you about the more we know about that the, the greater we can adjust the budget as we move closer toward it so i've been kind of asking town since you moved town meeting can we just take our time with the budget especially you know some, someone like, like sundowns where there's a lot of moving parts and it's a lot tighter um you know so there's those those uh, town uh hearings are going to be happening in probably in april so that's kind of the game plan is for that um, right now, what we're looking at. So give me a little bit more time. We could rush it. We're doing, I think we're doing Conway's in March because theirs is kind of wrapped up already. They, they got a pretty straightforward budget without any up, huge ups and downs. They're okay. So we're getting theirs out of the way, but the other um, elementary schools are gonna be done in April. Um, and so we'll have more time to talk about how things are fluctuating. So, so they're on different time cycles. I just wanna make sure we're clear on that. <clears throat> Thank you. Right, thanks. All right, so I guess if there's no other questions for now on Frontier, we can roll over to the Sunderland Elementary. I'll, I'll put you back. You don't get a reintroduction, yeah. Shelley. You get only <laughs> one introduction. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just going to pull uh, up the right document. Do Should I share? Is that easier if I just share my screen? Sure, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Um, so similar process here, that level service approach, you're gonna see all of this repeated from the frontier budget, but just to be transparent about how we went about the process, um, we did uh, duplicate existing staffing programs and services from FY21. Um, we looked at the cost of living and step or column changes based on contract obligations for teachers and IAs. Um, since I gave you that number for Frontier, I'll give it to you here as well. Um, teachers, uh, the, the impact to the general fund for teachers and IAs, um, and I say the general fund, I didn't explain this for Frontier, but just to make sure for if there's public listening or if any of you don't um, know, but some of our staffing are paid from other funding sources. So I'm strictly talking about what hits the general fund budget here because that's what the town contributes to specifically. Um, so it's about a two and a half percent increase um, to the general fund, just shy of $75,000 that we're looking at there for the cost of living adjustment and step and column changes for teachers and instructional assistants. Um, so then, you know, same process, look at union staff, principal, support staff, custodians, cafeteria, and then also any increases for um, central office that will be getting um, wage increases for next year. Look at non-salary accounts expenses to make sure that we're making adjustments up or down based on historical data. Um, and then again, built in, building in increases for uh, operating expenses, which really is primarily only utilities at the elementary school level. And there's not a lot of them because we you know, don't have the um, electric bill, but heat and those kind of things um, we do look at. And then the insurance related is really just central office related since the town covers insurances for school employees. Um, so then we look at enrollment uh, projections and classroom sizes to make sure whether or not we need additional staff and then review those evolving revolving accounts, um, school lunch, school choice, early childhood and special education revolving to make sure that the expenses from the prior year can continue to be paid moving forward based on our anticipated revenues. So after all of that, um, Sunderland Elementary, uh, based on the last discussion with school committee is looking at an increase of 6.66%. Um, total general fund budget of uh, roughly 3.1 million. And then we will also use um, revolving funds and grant monies to cover the total operating budget of the school of 3.8 million. Um, so just to give you an idea of what some of those significant increases are here, uh, we had last year froze the general fund budget um, in anticipation of COVID needs going into FY21. And so we were able to save primarily a lot of our school choice money um, because we decreased our general fund budget and put anything that was gonna be on school choice onto the general fund. Um, so that influx of cash into school choice wasn't an increase of revenue. It was really savings from the local budget. And so we paid additional expenses in FY21 with those savings. Moving forward, 
um, we don't want to continue to pay those expenses from school choice because it's going to deplete our funds. It's going to put the school in a position of hardship should there be an unforeseen expenditure. So the first step here was to move $100,000 of expenses that we paid in FY21 from school choice back to the general fund in 22. Um, so that is a significant number there that impacted the 6.66%. Um, and then we had to look at those revolving accounts, as I said previously. Um, two of them were hit particularly hard, uh, early childhood due to significantly lower enrollment than in prior years, and our school lunch programs. Um, school lunches are free for all students right now. We do receive some state and federal reimbursement. However, we are barely covering um, food and supply costs. Um, we're not even sure that we're going to be able to continue to fund salaries and wages and maybe looking for an alternative funding source um, to pay salaries and wages through the rest of the year. And uh, early childhood with revenue so significantly down, um, even though the numbers were decreased, we actually couldn't decrease any staffing because we still are meeting the needs of our special education population. Um, so one would, might think naturally with a reduced enrollment, then you would have reduced staffing, but that's not necessarily the case here um, because we, we do still have to uh, service our special education population. So those two pieces um, total about another $95,000 or so, 90,000 um, of expenses that were moved from revolving funds, previously paid from revolving funds, moved over to the general fund in FY22. Then uh, based on enrollment and classroom sizes, and Darius already touched on this, I think you did that there's going to be um, an increase in, is it the K class, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but we're expecting additional students coming into, um, I think kindergarten, which is gonna require another teacher coming in. Um, so that's a $55,000 increase to the budget right there. Something that I know has been on school committee's radar for some time, and it has been talked about, um, over the months and months and months that we've been prepping for this year's budget. And it's just one of those things that we really can't avoid at this point based on population. Um, so then the final thing that we take into consideration is the central office cost share percentages, uh, which is actually going down for Sunderland um, as far as not for the assessment side, but just in what the elementary school portion of central office shared expenses are. Uh, and then we look at personnel changes as well. So if we have any significant teacher changes, it is more than likely that we're gonna hire somebody at a lower step. Usually someone goes out of the system, maxed out on the salary scale. So we bring in someone mid-level. Um, so those changes resulted in about 42,000 in personnel changes and then 17,000 in the cost share contribution for central office expenditures. So if we didn't see those changes there, we'd be looking at another 2% increase. So um, we're thankful that, you know, that's helping out the Sunderland budget. Um, so similar to Frontier, I gave you all of those DESE function codes here, and then you can see the comparative 20 to 21 to 22 and what those changes are related to. Um, the most significant is to that uh, instruction, you know, anything that's directly student instruction related. Um, and that is in part because of um, addition of those school choice wages. So we moved some expenses again to, to 21 into school choice, whether it's IAs or teachers from our savings from last year. Then we have the COLA and column and step changes that were taken into consideration. And then we have that new teacher that we added in. So that's why that those instructional services are so much higher. Um, pupil services, again, is anything related to nursing, guidance, um, food service, transportation. Uh, and the most significant increase here is that we moved part of the guidance salary over to school choice in uh, FY21 with our savings. And so we're having to get that back on the local budget there. Minor changes um, up or down to the other categories. Um, so the total increase there, 196,000 or 6.66%. Um, so just some further discussion points. Uh, I know, you know, this is only my second go around with you all, but I do know from school committee that there has been discussion about the use of school choice funds between the select board, the finance committee and the school committee. Um, so I'm probably not telling you anything that you don't know, but just to put it out there for the public, 
um, using school choice funds to supplement the budget is perfectly acceptable. Um, but in such a significant capacity as we've been doing it in the last couple of years is not best practice. And it can really set us up for failure in the long run. Um, we are exceeding our revenue with expenditures over the last two years. Um, and it's just not sustainable long-term. Um, and again, I know you all have had this conversation, but we're just bringing it back to the forefront because what we would like to do is make the conscious decision to move school choice expenses over the next couple of years onto another funding source, which will likely be general fund so that we can continue to carry one year of choice reserves, which just helps protect the district when we have unforeseen expenditures come up. Um, so one of those unforeseen expenditures is actually coming into play in FY22. Um, it's something that came up this year where we had a student come into the district uh, that we had to place out um, because we could not meet that student's needs. This year, we have found grant money to cover that expenditure. However, those grant funds will not be available next year. So we are looking at an $80,000 out of district placement that we're gonna pay with school choice funds next year, which is a perfect example of how school choice reserves should be used. Um, so moving forward, we wanna get more of those recurring salary expenditures off of choice and onto the general fund uh, to make sure that we do have adequate funding to cover some of these expenses. Um, one other thing to note here with early childhood and school lunch is right now, we don't know what either of those programs look like in the fall. Um, they both could have increased revenue, which would help support wages that we placed onto the general fund. If not making changes in 22, definitely making changes, our hope is for 23 and moving those wages back to those revolving funds. Um, we do see this as a short-term temporary issue, but it is going to take us a couple of years to get our programs back up to where they need to be. Um, but we just want it to be transparent and knowing that we're not forgetting that these were um, uh, positively functioning programs. You know, I don't think either of them were making a significant amount of money, but we were at least covering a significant portion of wages and having some re reserves for unforeseen expenses, which we're happy we did because last year we continued to pay staff when the crisis came up and we had those reserves to do that. Um, so that's on our mind. And that's part of the reason why elongating this budget process is helpful for us because if we learn more about what the state requirements are for early childhood or school lunch next year and whether or not we can return to some normalcy and bring in some revenue there you know in another month we may have more info and even in may we might have more info at that point so we can always make changes as needed um, and it's just something that we're continuing to monitor uh, so the last piece here is uh, that there will be roughly $50,000 in sick buyback and uh, retirement benefit payouts for Sunderland Elementary next year. Uh, the school committee did talk about this at length and, and how we would pay for that, whether we would use school choice funds, um, whether we place it on the general fund budget, but that would obviously inflate the number in one year. Um, again, something that I know that has been discussion with select board and finance committee in the past, because I know that town warrant has been raised previously to cover this expense. I don't think it was quite significant an amount, um, but that is a request that school committee would like to discuss further and ask the town to support. Um, we do not ex see any retirements right now, although our staff, I believe based on the contract, faculty has until October 1st to notify us for the following um, budget year. So something very well could come up between now and then, but as it stands right now, we don't have any retirements that would hit the 23 budget. Um, before we go to questions, new updated info. So one of the things that has been beneficial with these you know, virtual meetings and use of Google Docs for us is that we can update with live information at any point. Um, and since the last school committee meeting, uh, we did receive notification that Sunderland Elementary would get a, an additional CARES Act. Um, it's a, called the ESSER II grant. Um, it is from uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's an emergency relief fund. We did get some funding for that this year as well, not such a significant amount. 
um, as we're going to see next year, and we have used that for COVID-related reasons. However, they did announce that this new allocation, which for Sunderland is going to be $75,000, that those funds can be used through September of 23. So that's actually fiscal year 24. Um, so we have several years to spread out these funds and school committee has not discussed this yet because at the last meeting we had heard that this was possibly coming but we didn't know what the allocation amount was going to be and we did not know how we would be able to use it so now that we know the allocation amount and we know that there is this clause in here about other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation of the school sorry <laughs> it happens well, sorry. inevitably with every meeting um, we can use this for salaries and wages if we need to, if it would mean that we had to um, furlough, lay people off, reduction in force, those funds are there and available for us to help supplement um, any of those increased costs. So while I think it's something that school committee absolutely needs to talk about still, we wanted to be transparent that this is an additional funding source that came up and it absolutely may help in reducing um, the general fund budget significantly. 75,000 is about 2.25%. So that would bring that 6.66% down um, somewhere around four, 4.25, somewhere in there. So, um, you know, that would be hugely helpful, uh, but we do need to talk about that a little bit further at the next meeting, but wanted you to know that that was there. And then uh, just the last piece, a reminder here of what FY21 budget was, and then just the percent increases, um, just so you could see what one, two, three, four, and five percent increase on the budget equates to. Again, a lot of information. I'm happy to take questions. I'll leave this up for a minute in case we need to go back to anything. Yeah, please, because I'm sure we've got some questions out there, quite a few. So um, now that seventy-five thousand that you're talking about, that's of course just a one-time pay-in. So it's not. I mean, we could certainly use it to offset something, but that's only going to be a one-year blip offset. So, yeah, the the or the, maybe you spread it out, but it's we not a permanent. We could spread offset. it out over several years. I um, mean, you're absolutely right that it is right as of right now, as it stands, it's a one-time influx of cash. So, um, the salaries and wages I'm referring to that we could pay out of this, I think it would be most fiscally responsible to pay for some of those revolving fund wages that we talked about. Mm -hmm the school lunch and the early childhood, because we do expect them to bring in more revenues of their own with the hopes that by 23, we could then cover that 75,000 out of those two revolving accounts. Um, the other option is to pay the out of district placement with that 75,000 and leave our school choice reserves um, or possibly move something from general fund over to school choice. But you know that has a little bit of a risk also, because then we, we may have to put it back. Um, so we do have to be careful, absolutely correct there in what we spend that money on. Okay, because I, I know, because I know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So um, I, maybe I'll start. I'm just looking down the row that I can see. I see Ellie. Do you have any? Do you have any questions there? I'm sure you got something. Well, it, it's not a specific question as much as it is common. It's a very conflicted in terms of uh, seeing the jump of six. 6 .6. Over six and a half is a really significant amount. Uh, as as far like it, it is encouraging in some to see the the school wanting to address the issues that that caused the problem in, in FY twenty, where the school choice had been had been pair, had been spent before we really needed it. And, and there was, you know, there were errors. So it's encouraging to know that that planning is is being made, but it's it's hard, it's difficult when it's when it's hitting at the same time as as COVID, and, and that's hitting us so hard. So on the one hand, I mean, it feels like at least some that that grant money would would really be helpful, and but. At the same time, that's a huge chunk of an increase. <laughs> you know, just a comment on that. I, you know, so we know last year we did our budget grew, even though we didn't grow what you know we paid for that in-house using the savings. So, in order to have the equal savings, we got to grow our budget twice in a single year. You know, and so 
that's kind of what we've created here. We, we passed on the savings and the fear that the, you know, we remember those numbers that were being thrown around, 20% reduction in six, chapter 70 and those kind of things. And that's what we were preparing for in doing so. And so we thought we were gonna be going into this year with massive, probably massive cuts um, in programming and whatnot, um, you know, after, you know, the passing that savings forward. So, you know, the, the contractual services as Shelly kind of pointed out, those, all those, those bills keep coming and so we have the natural growth of the budget now with two years put together. So, um, you know, and I think, I think the, um, just to go back onto the, the ESSERT money, you know, the ESSERT money applying that toward the, the school committee has to talk about that, but applying that toward the revolving accounts, which may get, you know, if we have a good, if things pop back nicely and went to optimistically, but you know, the way things are kind of running right now, maybe it'd be more pessimistically, but, um, you know, those, those programs are going to have some revenue, you know, and quite frankly, by the end of the year end, you know, they, we could be, you know, bringing in, you know, using the asset money that can fluctuate the amount of money we spend on that um, might be a wise choice, and that will bring down that cost as well. So being closer to four um, in the four range, I think is probably realistic of where we were going to be if we're going to hold two years without doing massive cuts, um, you know. Thoughts. I mean, it sounds like it, it makes sense that, I mean, if those are the, if, if those revolving funds, the, the, the lunch services, uh, and, and, and those were, were such an incredible cost with, with none of the revenue coming in to, to offset that. I mean, it makes, it feels like that's a natural intent of what the, this grant is supposed to be there to support, but I mean, that is the biggest hardship that our budget seems to be facing. It's it's just also frustrating to, the temptation is not to want to use up a grant like that all, all, all immediately. But I mean, it, it feels like this is when those programs are hitting us the most. And yeah, hopefully we can, and the, the danger is is the idea of, being hopeful about it. I don't know. Yeah. And that's Scott. why, she, oh, sorry, Scott. Go ahead, no, go ahead Darius. No. I was only gonna say that's why Shelly does use very conservative numbers. You know what I mean? To say that we're, we have to fund those positions in the entirety when we know that we're gonna get some money, but we don't know how much. But if you, if you aren't conservative in doing that and you're wrong, then you're doing mid-year layoffs and mid-year ch program changes and that's, that's worse for, for kids in, in, cult, in school culture, so. So if I, if I could, Mr. Chair, um, mm -hmm. first line, thanks Shelly for the, the work. It's spelled out well, it's relatively easy to follow. It's a question and a comment about the choice use of funds, 19 to 20, 2019, 2020, we had a 351,000 plus increase in the operating budget of the elementary school. That part of that, almost 200 plus thousand dollars, was to move choice expenses or expenses being paid for for choice that were recurring to the general fund. Now it's two budget cycles later and it's still not enough. I understand last year was a, uh, an interesting year with respect, with respect to expenses and the kind of uncertainty. It wasn't a normal year in any way, shape or form. But in, in a two or three, say a three year budget cycle, you're talking about moving half a million dollars off of choice to general fund. I'm using big numbers as my, my dear former compatriot in the finance committee, Bruce Gordon used to say, round numbers. You're talking about a big movement and the question becomes outside of enrollment, why? Was it really that out of whack with use of school choice or is it simply expenses that aren't being, aren't really, really being monitored well? I don't mean that as an aspersion. I just mean it as expenses. Half a million dollars in a couple of years is a lot of money for a town that takes in less than $200,000 in new growth. Sure, and I can't speak to historically necessarily what's happened because I've Understood. been here. 
you know, the two budget cycles. I can see, you know, I, I did anticipate that we would have some choice discussion. So, you know, I can see in FY20 that uh, expenses were significantly, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the savings that we made, why we dropped them. So what year did you all move more money over to the general fund going was, into FY20? It was 1920. Yeah. Okay. Because I had thought we were shifting the bulk of those over and we were mostly done with that. But they actually went to the town for an override question that year. Right. That's the backdrop. Right. That's right. not going to happen again. It's not possible. Right. Yeah, and, and I can look more historically into what we were doing, you know, obviously wasn't here at that time we had TMS the consulting firm. Um, right. I can I can see that the fund is growing, you know, going into the 20 year it only had about 95,000 left in the fund. Um, you know, and then going into 21 because of some of the savings we had over 300 um, going into 22 we had over 200,000. Um, and we're trying to stay around that mark with, with a fund balance so that if expenses come up of 80,000 for out of district or whatever it is, we have those um, funds there. But, you know, I, I know myself moving forward, you know, that approach is to try to shift as much as we can so that we're not overexpending. Um, you know, and and that's I, actually I know. consistent with what, the, with what the goal was in, in engaging the town to raise taxes to fund the general fund for the elementary school was to make it more sustainable. That, and, and it's nice to hear formulaically that we're close to that, but these numbers are pretty, pretty sizable only a couple of years later. Yeah, and, and we're not near done the work yet, right? So if we're yeah. only bringing in 340,000 in revenue, but we've got, you know, 420 or 430,000 in expenses, we're still overspending. So, yep. you know, and it, it's primarily staffing, quite frankly, there's, you know, there's no frivolous expenditures going on at the, at the elementary school. Um, so, you know, we're looking closely at what staffing looks like to make sure that we're not overstaffed, that we are meeting the needs of the community um, based on the existing staffing in place. But, um, you know, I hate to be the one to say this publicly in a meeting, but without some significant personnel changes, which school committee, I don't believe is behind supporting that yet, nor is the principal, um, you know, it's going to be difficult for us to overcome this challenge. Well, I'm just thinking to one of your points earlier, Scott, um, you talk about the revenue growth, the 196,667, that's basically roughly and you know talk about large numbers our revenue growth right there not even counting the increase for frontier uh, so just if i could about insurance for the central office is that by formula and what does that cover i'll get um, you right I, in a second i have a three and a half percent increase in there for insurances, but Sunderland's cost share percentage for central office is actually going down based on the enrollment formula. Um, so you're not yes. seeing, I know, <laughs> so you're not actually yeah. seeing an increase. It's about $17,000 across the board of shared okay. central office expenses that Sunderland's going down. Again, I mean, these things are like, you know, I, I, part of this I'm trying to still wrap my head around as the newbie <laughs> of how do we go one year up so high and down year, you know, so low. Right. Um, it doesn't, it, it, it's not smooth and easy for anybody. So um, we are seeing a decrease there. And, and even though the insurance is built in, um, but it covers the health and the dental, which is um, through the Hampshire insurance group. Yep. Um, I don't know if Sunderland belongs to the same. I know some of the other towns do. Um, you know, and then uh, there are some contributions to life insurance policies and things like that um, for some central office staff. Okay, thank you. I know uh, question was, I know Tom's got one and Greg had one first there. So why don't you pop in there, Greg, get a comment or question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I, I know talking uh, with the school committee, we're committed to finding a path forward. Uh, we understand there are constraints on both sides and, uh, you know, we need to, find a way to, to make it work collectively. Uh, and I was very grateful for the support we had uh, in, in that override. Uh, 
but I think, and uh, I can let uh, Darius and, uh, and Ben speak to this as well, or any of the committee members, um, that was really to, to move some funds from choice uh, and, and onto the general budget. Um, that wasn't a one-time deal where if we get this, we're gonna be good for a decade. Uh, we knew, even talking with uh, the previous uh, accounting firm, uh, we had taken a long time to get into to trouble and it was gonna take a while to dig out. Uh, and I get that with COVID, uh, best laid plans, everyone's scrambling, but uh, you know, we're absolutely receptive to things like what you think we ought to do with a grant and, uh, and trying to find a path forward. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Tom, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, a, a couple. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> last, last Thursday, one of the uh, probably greatest thing that's happened to the, to the world, we got to see our robot land on Mars. Well, one of the people working on that project was a Sundown Elementary School graduate. And Carissa Tudrin went to Sundown Elementary. Sundown Elementary fostered that in that, that little girl when she started out. But, and there's always a but. Um, It'd be interesting to see what a two and a half percent budget would look like. I, I, and and we can't, you know, you you talked about the expenses of of COVID. Um, there's a lot. There's many families that don't have pay, any pay at all coming into them right now because of the COVID. Many many of the guys I work with, their their overtime was cut. They're just, you know, they they're they no longer have overtime. Overtime is something they haven't seen in, in a year now. And, and they use that overtime to help help pay for things. Scott, Scott was, was on task is that just a short time ago, two budget cycles ago, we, we, we passed an override basically to try to, to put stability into our budget. But when you're looking at a six, six and a half percent increase, I, I would love to have the conversation with, with anyone that could tell me that that's a sustainable number. I, I just, Ben and, and Darius, you, you, I, I've heard nothing but great things about what you guys have done over this past 12 months with the COVID. But right now is a, a six, or even a 4% budget increase it, it's very difficult. And I, 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 would, I, would, I would like to turn it around right now. How would you sell to the town of Sunderland, to the residents, a 6% increase? What would, how would you justify that, that expenditure? And it's, it's different, the difference between sitting in a school committee's chair and a select board chair is that you guys come up with your the 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 budget that you recommend, but it's us that have to come up with the money. I I just don't see where we would have that when you get a 14, 15% increase at Frontier and a 6% increase here, how we would be expected to come up with that time of type of money. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Peter, I see you pop down there. Yeah, hi. I just want to give a slightly different uh, perspective on the numbers here, and that is that I think the starting point has to be a rate, a recognition that the current year budget, FY21, is level funded from the FY20 budget. And that happened both at Frontier and at the elementary school. And Frontier, because also our percentage had gone down. I think the frontier budget that Sunderland had to pay for was actually down somewhat over hundred thousand. So and and so then I know obviously know more about the elementary school budget. Um, you still have uh, staff expenses, the, uh, the the cola and the steps and so on that you have to deal with, and so having a level funded budget for the current year 
the way that that was done was to put those expenses, and again, roughly something like $75,000, pay that through school choice. Uh, we had what turned out to be a one-year uh, significant amount of extra school choice income due to SPED costs, and therefore, you know, that was uh, an okay way to do it. But all of our uh, conversation over the past couple of years in terms of what is the right way to run our school choice operation is that that sort of expense should not be going on to school choice in a permanent way because it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's not the right way. It just puts you in a deeper hole, okay? So that if you, for, you know, complaints about a 6.6% budget increase, I think you have to look at it in, in, in connection with also what happened for the current year, which was a 0% increase, okay? And I think you have to look at the frontier increase again, over two years. And it still may be that you say, okay, it's still too much because 3.3 for the elementary school per year is, you know, more than at most two and a half we can afford if that and so on. But it, it puts us much more in the ballpark and much, you know, basically part of the increase this year is saying that the FY20 COLA and STEP increases, which we funded for one year in school choice, are going back in the general budget. Okay, you take that, you take this year's COLA and STEP, and you take the additional teacher, okay, and there's our increase. Okay, you're actually also funding in the general budget this year uh, money for uh, staff in our two revolving funds that have severe revenue shortages this year the school lunch and the early childhood. Okay, um, so that, you know, and, and you say, well, how's this being done? Well, the school's been on a freeze since I believe in December, an expense freeze, okay, to save whatever money we can save. And there are a number of accounts where, you know, under the COVID circumstances, we've, we've had savings. One of, for example, is in substitutes, we're, we're spending much less on substitutes. And, um, um, you know, but, but essentially, the, the, I think the, you know, I, I can understand why Tom and Scott are, are, are complaining about the number, but I think if you look at it on a two year basis and you look at what goes into it, I, I think the school is being, is being very responsible. Now it's not to say that, you know, that number can't, you know, come down some, but you know, it's sure to me is not an irresponsible number. But to just be clear, I never said it was irresponsible. And and based on town meetings vote last year, neither was zero. So it's important to bear that in mind as well. Right. I mean, we've worked, to, we've worked together consistently to fund the school at a at a level that's important to the school's success, and we'll continue to do that. But can't get away from the fact that it was a hundred and thirty-five thousand dollar increase last year at the elementary school and three hundred and fifty-one thousand dollars the year before. That's just math. What's what's the hundred and thirty-five thousand? It's on the spreadsheet right here under elementary school. Change from FY twenty. I have to check. Anyway, anyway, we're we're actually all on the same team. Uh, you got to be abundantly clear that there's not five hundred thousand dollars to put toward education, or or the four hundred thirty-eight thousand that's being presented tonight available without going back to the townspeople and asking for an override. We don't have it in reserves. It's not sustainable in reserves and we don't have it in new growth. And it's the baseline for next year. That's just reality. The window for closing of uh, the annual ballot is closed. Can't put a ballot question on the election. That's done. I, I, I think one of the considerations in bringing this forward was that the guidance that we'd received from the select board was for level services budget. Right. Okay. And, and this to me was a realistic view at what a level services budget was. Yep. Okay, now if, uh, if the guidance needs to be something different, then we need to know, we need to have some idea of, you know, to what extent we're talking about. Is that a fair comment? No, absolutely. I agree, Peter. We've worked together for years. Yeah, and, and I, if I phrase something wrong, I apologize because I don't, no. you know, I don't like to throw around words that 
you know, or, or have connotations to them. And so right, it's right. just, we, but there really was an attempt with this to say, okay, let's, we need to submit a budget that is level services. And the reason the number is high is because last year we swallowed up, okay, what would have been whatever the increase would have been, okay, because of the circumstances of COVID. So I don't know, you know, I don't know how you and, and the finance committee, you know, want us to proceed. Um, don't know, you know, but as Darius said, at some point in here, we got some time to work this out. Right, right. You know, it's not being done tonight, uh, but it's, this is a good step in, you know, getting you guys aware of the situation. Right, I appreciate that. And, and the other thing is I, I look at this and I say, we are in this, uh, in Shelley's presentation, note that there's an $80,000 increase for an out-of-district placement, okay? That's being handled within the funds available to the school. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the keys there is that this is a one-year thing because this will be a student that's only got one more year left at Sunderland Elementary, okay? So then in the following year, that's not gonna, you know, you could say, well, should you be paying for that out of school choice? Yeah, it's a one-time thing. It's not a recurring thing, okay? Right. And in the following year, actually, the town will get some money back through the circuit breaker, okay? Likewise, we have, you know, in the overall budget money for the two revolving funds that we don't know at this point how soon those guys are going to get back to normal. But when assume, you have to assume they will. When they get back to normal, this is also going to be expenses for wage, for, for salaries that will drop off the budget, okay? But in the meantime, we got to deal with them. Right. So that we had a part of our discussion was to come here with a budget increase that was in the three to 4% range, but that knocked the, put the ending balance of school choice down under a hundred thousand. And, and, you know, one of the concerns there is that in a lot of these things, you know what number you're going to get for, you know, uh, some of these revenue sources. I mean, within a very small margin of error, you know what number you're going to get. Okay. School choice, you don't know until you've earned it. Okay. So you won't know what number, you won't know what number you're going to get in FY22, the budget year we're talk, working on here, until starting next, sep next uh, September and ending, you know, June 15 months from now. So, you know, we got to be careful. So anyway, that's, that's some of the thinking that went into this. I think it was, you know, I, I think it, the number may not, may be, you know, too high, but I think it's, the, it, it was the right thing to present. Mm -hmm. And I think the thinking is honest. Okay. And, you know, thanks to Shelley continued good work. It's, you know, it's transparent. I don't think there's stuff being hidden here. It's just, this is what, you know, the situation is, right? So we need to move, you know, we got to figure out how to move forward at this point. Right, I think we've, we've reached that point in the meeting where we're all sitting under the weight of the numbers at the moment right? and trying to digest it. Right. Because <sighs> there's no magic uh, formula and we can't run, you know, deficits like the federal government. So <sighs> we have to approach it a little differently than they do. Ellie, did you, um, did you have a question or a comment? I thought you saw your hand up there. Nope. Uh, I did, but I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no, that's all right. I just want to make sure I get everybody's questions and comments in. <clears throat> well, this is sort of the introductory pass, I guess, at it too. So luckily we do have a little more time given the uh, the schedule this year and things, so. <clears throat> Greg had his hand up. Greg, yep. Oh, you're on mute, Greg. Very briefly, if I may. I, yep. I wanted to, yeah, thank thank Peter for uh, for that eloquent uh, description of, of our dis discussions. Uh, it is true that we looked at a range of numbers. Uh, we did get a question, well, uh, how would you explain this to the town people? Um, we, I, I will echo what Shelley said, which is uh, we went with some conservative estimates. We looked at 
oh, we could get money coming in here, we could get money coming in there. We're not gonna plan on that. So that's also a part of what's driving the number. Uh, and again, as we get further down the road, uh, you know, we may find that uh, um, some of that stuff gets taken care of. We still have the question out there regarding the, uh, the $50,000, uh, whether the town wants to do that or we put that on the budget. Um, but I, I, we definitely came in thinking, okay, we were protecting this uh, choice year over year. And if we came in with a lower number, it would mean eating into that. And we wanted to make people aware that this is the number that would preserve that and lower numbers could eat into it. So, it, you know, we'll go back and sharpen our pencils and more information will win. Thank you. Elliot. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Is that good? Yeah. So uh, to Greg and the committee and the administration, that, that having those uh, reserves was one of the selling points th three budget cycles ago, two calendar years ago. And I'm glad to see that that plan has worked out. I understand it's not, uh, maybe not to its fullest at this point, but it's nice to see that that worked out, so. But did it work out, Scott? Well, it didn't work out with respect to expenses, Tom, because more are moving on. But, you know, if it was zeros, that's another animal. Right, but you have to go back to, you know, Tom, that comment you said there, that if we remove COVID and we remove the new teacher, okay, our budget is now in the two and a half range. And that's, the, that's a natural growth that we're going to have. And if you want to get below two and a half, you're going to have to have other grants to offset because your natural growth, your budget is, is over two and a half between the actual growth of the outside expenditures and um, you know, wages. And so it, it, it's a very, um, it's, it's going to be tight every year moving forward. Um, you know, just the way that the, the way this is set up, I, 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 and, you know, how do you, I don't know how we're going to weave around that when you had any kind of outside issue you know, from additional class, well, you have more students. So we have, to, we have to have an additional teacher. Well, that's not a problem the school created. I would say that's a problem the town created by having too many kids. You know, <laughs> it's a funny way of saying it, but it's not like, you know, we didn't say, hey, let's go create a new science course so we can send more people to, to NASA. You know, we're, we're saying you know, we have to expand the, 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 the size of the school. So if the school continues to grow as the population grows, how is how are we going to I maybe mean, that's going to be a whole separate meeting i think but we're going to have to sit down with with you folks again and talk about how we grow the budget if the population continues to grow because the way the town of sunderland is set up is that you don't have enough revenue sources from the way your population is distributed in your town in the sense that you don't have big industry you don't have other people paying taxes outside the you know you, know, you have a larger apartment complex i've heard the scott you gave the, the, the statistics about the number of apartments living in the size of town versus the rest of Massachusetts, that kind of thing, per population or something like that. So that becomes becomes a situation, you know, that I'm worried about long term. You know, you know, we did fix it. We didn't ask for COVID to wipe out both our, ro uh, our, our, our uh, revolving account programs, you know, um, and we could we could throw all the school choice money into it, you know, but, you know, and to lower those things or we can make cuts. Um, I really think we, you know, to sell the school right now, we want to be able to start the next school year off as strong as possible because there is a lot of transition happening right now with families and students. You want your schools to be strong going into next year or else you, it, it, choice is all coming up. You know, everybody's deciding as they come out, they're going to peek their heads on the Groundhog Day, they're going to peek their head out and they're going to say, now, if we're going to make a change, we, can, we should do it now. And so I think we want our programs to be strong. We don't want to be cutting things. Um, you know, I think Greg is absolutely right. We can sharpen our pencils. Those numbers can come down. But it's not going to get down to two and a half, um, and I would recommend that then it goes back to the taxpayer and they decide, you know, do they want, you know, the, do they want the school to be make reductions, become less attractive, um, in that kind of thing. And, and so at some point, where where does that we hand that question back on to, to you know the, the people who, who use the school? So, um, well, well, you know, you, you know, we've been on both sides of that decision. We celebrate when it's a success and we cry when it's not. Yep. Oh. 
And the type of demographics that you're talking about aren't things that are going to change uh, much at all, really, because, right. you know, it, it's not like we have the ability to, there's only so much land in town, you know, so you can't, it's not something you can immediately go out and change. And, you know, like, that's a constant tension in any community. This is not unique to Sunderland. People on one side will say, well, we want, we want more, you know, property tax offset by business and things like that. But then when it comes time to having those businesses come in, there's naturally a, a push against that. So that's a constant tension in society that uh, is not going to be miraculously solved by any stretch. So it's, it's just spring in Sunderland. Yeah, that's right. We haven't even hit mud season yet. Exactly. Right? <laughs> but I think mean, to your earlier point, Scott, too, is it's too late to put an override question on the ballot, even if that was some, you know, some, so that option is is not on the table as a tool this year. Not without a special election. Right. So we have to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and then, of course, it, you know, if you do that, that comes with the whole you know, with all of the issues that that brings up, so. Go. Yeah. I do appreciate the quality of the information tonight, as well as the dialogue, oh. I really do. Nobody ever said this was easy. If it was, you know, right. I don't know. <laughs> it's not an easy job, so. <clears throat> I don't know, I was told it was gonna be easy when I yeah. was hired, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, you may better wanna go back and check that. <laughs> I mean, you can, you know, balancing, you could get a spreadsheet to balance the numbers, but it's the decisions that you have to make to get to that point that, you know, we all know are tough. Uh, so. Well, we'll canoodle over this the next couple of weeks and we'll yep. stay in touch. Be, be a lot of canoodling. <clears throat> Any other questions or uh, general comments at all? I guess just so we can get on the same page for timeline, when mm. do, you know, I shouldn't be really making up a timeline on numbers that you guys have need to move the, you know, the town kind of meeting forward and that kind of stuff. But I guess give the school committee and myself some direction on, it's good to have a deadline so that we line up our meetings as such. And then we line up, you know, the public hearing and such so that, you know, cause I keep it open as long as possible, but at the same time, we also have to have deadlines where we have to start making decisions on how we're going to move forward. So do you guys have any idea on that? Do you want to, you can get back to me as well, discuss yeah, it further about you know so. mapping that out. I think well, let's do that and then you know. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm saying like by the end of April, do you want it? You know, just some general thing by May 15th, do you want it? You know, what is the you know, those yeah. are kind of you know, that kind of uh, August, September, maybe, you know. <laughs> you got a town meeting, no. I believe, yeah. on the books. <laughs> That's we, we, right. we, town meeting is scheduled for second week of June. June, yep. So we would need it at, a, at the absolute maximum of the delivery date would be 14 days prior to that. Okay. So early yeah. May, that would be that would be like go time. We got to have something that's a real plan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, you guys. We appreciate it. Thanks again for having us. All right. Um, concluding with that, I see, I thought I saw, is she, there she is. She's still out there, Laurie. Thanks for hanging in there. We've, no reached, problem. we've reached the COVID-19 update. So maybe here we'll have some numbers that we can all at least go yay over. <laughs> I think that's certainly possible. Uh, um, the update from the Board of Health chair says we have exactly three, three. active cases in nice. Sunderland at the moment. And I think she, she said those were UMass students? Was and they were all it? traced back to UMass, yes. Okay. So that is very good news. Um, based on my numbers for the previous two weeks, the report that came out last Thursday said we were at 33. I say we will go down to about 25 when the new report comes out this Thursday. So, okay. you know, over two weeks, it's a significant drop and hopefully the following week, it'll be a bigger drop. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Any other um, updates from your end, Laurie? Um, February 25th and 26th is the vaccine clinic at Treehouse Brewing. 
I my understanding know. is it is full. Um, but, you know, everybody who's had an appointment and have to move it a couple of different times, just, you know, to, to pay attention, it is coming. They do have the vaccine in house. So that's a good thing. Yep, and we had the announcements go out. I know about that, and I, I'd like to thank all the volunteers who uh, put a lot of time and effort into getting that set up. It's greatly appreciated. I think uh, folks, you know, have to remember a lot of that is is volunteer work. So, sure is really really great stuff. <clears throat> yep. And um, one final thing is MEMA announced they have some surplus supplies. I sent around. Um, to the fire department, the police department, the DPW, the town, the library, asking folks need certain PPE. I got the lists back of what folks need and I turned that list into MEMA today. Oh, so, Thank you. How yeah. many SCBAs did the fire department ask for? <laughs> <laughs> That's not PPE. Oh. <laughs> what was that, a I new hook and ladder? What? <laughs> So no, we're talking gloves, sanitizer, sanitizer stations, fire trucks, that kind yeah. of stuff. Great. So thank you. All right. Thanks. Yeah. That's it for me. All right. right. Thanks. But next week it'll be zero. I look forward to that. Oh, you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I know. I think we all are. I'll tell you. <clears throat> and, Thanks, Lori. Jeff, anything from your end? Uh, the only thing is we got some updated guidance on uh, coronavirus relief funds. And uh, there's what the state's calling a reconciliation period. Um, we had two rounds where they gave us money. And, and this is, I think, to a point Scott made last week about how we're doing with the funds. And so Still unclear what FEMA is and isn't covering, um, but we have until June something if we need to apply for more funds. So they've extended the deadline, um, the, the reconciliation period uh, until June. So a little bit more flexibility. Okay, all right, that's good. All right. <clears throat> All right, Any, anything else on uh, COVID this week? Well, if I could, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, just please. expand on what uh, Lori said that uh, Sunderland has between 16 and 20 volunteers that are working over at uh, the Treehouse Brewery uh, on Thursday and Friday. So I would like to personally thank each, each and every one of those volunteers. Um, who, under, who, under, who really understand the importance um, of community was something that our governor fails to understand. Um, as he goes into max vac vaccination and doesn't look at how Franklin County, Hampshire County, Berkshire County are, we don't really have any mass transit. We can't get from point A to point B on a public transportation easily um, so having having max vac vaccination sites in east springfield and gillette stadium and fenway park they may be able to push through numbers but you're not going to you aren't going to get to actually gain inroads into our our population that needs a service that being said we've talked to our state senator joe comerford and natalie blay who have both been very um, concerned with the lack of, of planning. And that's truly what it is on the state's part right now. Uh, um, and Jill Comerford has been appointed to uh, head up uh, an organization, uh, a joint committee in the legislature um, to work with trying to come and restore equity to the distribution of the vaccinations so that all the residents of the state, no matter of your uh, income bracket or your racial, or if you're homebound, will have advantage to being able to get this critical vaccination. You ask what, why, um, 
local thing. Vaccination EDS sites are important. And I would, I would say that um, on our telephone call from our senior center that goes out to our seniors, when they tell them that there's a, you can go to a, a, a dispensing site in Greenfield or Deerfield, almost uniformly, they all wanna to come to Deerfield. Um, they say that's too far to go to Greenfield. And there's many people that have that same, same thing. So we do, have 20, we do have 15 to 20 volunteers from Sunderland that, that'll participate. I can guarantee that when they walk out of that, when, when they walk out after their three or four hour shift, they'll be the most fulfilled that they will ever, ever been. But everybody that gets the shot, everybody who works there are happy. We could use a little more happy. That's very true. Can can always use more of that. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's go through um, before we discuss. I don't know if we want to discuss anything on the uh, borrowing authorization. You know, we've got that up on. I don't know if there's anything new to discuss on that today. I, would, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. We've got a lot yeah. to digest about. Uh, expense requests. Yes. All right. That's what I thought. <clears throat> um, then we have select board updates. I don't have any myself this week, I don't think so. Well, Tom. I, would, I would just remind people about the caucus next Saturday morning That's and to right. remind them that there are open slot, open spaces on the ballot. If they want to serve the community, they should go to the caucus and get their name on the ballot. And I think uh, announcement I not long before I came down here tonight was um, yep. sent out. So oh. thanks for getting that out there. Tom, anything? Right. Uh, so our, our Jeff, are we getting a recommendation from the Board of Health about changing? Are they are they thinking of changing their uh, protocols in town because of the new numbers or they're still going to hold a 25% occupancy? This, this is the second week now, isn't it, Tom? Yeah. This is. Yep. But I thought we'd get a word back from the Board of Health how they'd like to proceed. Good point. Yes, they're, uh, my understanding is they're, they have a meeting this evening and they're going to be discussing it um, okay. based on the numbers that were sent out today of only three cases in town. I think it's highly likely that, that they're going to vote to rescind the order this evening. Okay, good. That'll be good. So we can get that announcement out quickly if, uh, if that's the case. And Jeff, if I, if I could, Mr. Chair, we'll contact those businesses that obviously broadcast publicly if that's the vote, as well as contact those affected businesses directly. After the vote? I think we did before, right? When we, had, when we came in with the drop in numbers. Uh, yes. We can contact. Great. Thank you. Exactly. We're lucky enough in that respect to have a small enough list. So it's a manageable thing. All right. Um, Jeff, do you have any updates you'd like to talk about? Nope. Nothing, nothing besides all the other things that are going on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, do we have any public comments at all this evening? I know we've already digested quite a bit tonight, so I think that kind of lays heavy on uh, on the evening. <clears throat> All right. Um, our next meeting is going to be Monday, March 1st. Hard to believe that we're already at March. Amazing. <clears throat> as, as the snow is, I don't know if it's still falling out there, but uh, and, uh, just a, sort of a general folks, be, uh, be careful out there because it was a little slippery earlier. They're getting out plowing and everything, but it's a bit of a slushy mess. So and temperatures are starting to drop a little bit. So let's try to take care out in the roads. Um, if there's nothing else, then um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, second. Second. All those in favor of adjourning at about uh, is it 13 past eight? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week.